Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, in my uh, presentation today, I want to speak a little bit about a project that I have been involved with for the past two years, or actually uh, about an initiative that dates back even longer. I think we started around 2011 uh, to uh, assemble a small community of people with the very sort of freeform goal to simply uh, find ways of better interconnecting data, and there we want to be really uh, quite open and not specific, but any kind of online data about uh, the, the past, really, uh, and linking it up according to linked data principles. So uh, just a question, I've never asked this before, but I think I can dare to do it now. Has anybody ever heard of the Pelagius project before? Okay, a few people, so that's, that's cool. Uh, yeah, for those who don't, uh, I'm going to give you the whole introduction today. So what is Pelagios? Um, as I said, uh, it's, it's sort of a very free-form initiative, a collective of people with the interest of connecting data about the past, and the way we do it is by uh, geography. So space is the interconnection medium we use to connect our online resources, and uh, at the moment we have around 40 partners from uh, around eight countries, uh, and those partners together have uh, accumulated one million annotations. And what I mean by annotations in this context, I will also make uh, clear uh, in these presentations. So the data is very heterogeneous. We have partners that maintain text archives, for example, uh, databases of archaeological sites, of archaeological objects, databases of inscriptions, museum databases, literature, uh, image collections, uh, any kind of, of data which is very heterogeneous, comes with their own formats, own description standards, uh, the only thing which is sort of homogeneous, or sort of the, the, core, the core idea behind it, is that every data uh, in some way relates to place. And that's the kind of principle that we want to leverage to get some organization into the data and to connect it. So that's the idea behind Pelagios. I think at this point it also makes sense to speak a little bit about what Pelagios is not about. Uh, so Pelagios is not a data aggregator, so we don't go to our partners and say, give us all your data and we'll host it at our own location. Uh, and then everything's going to be fine. So that's not what we do. We're not a repository. Uh, and we're not a standard data model. So we don't uh, want to mandate a single data model which everybody should adhere to. And once they adhere to the data model, everything uh, will be interoperable. So that's also not the idea of Pelagios. So um, if we're not here to do anything useful, what are we doing? Um, so the idea, uh, we have given it the name of connectivity through common references rather than a common schema. So the idea is that everybody is free to explore, express the data in whichever way they like, but when they make a reference to a place, then they should do so using URIs. So uh, Pelagos is exactly uh, based on the idea of using URIs uh, to refer to entities, and since Pelagos is about place, we're speaking specifically about place URIs. I'll give you an example of how that can work. What we see here uh, is one page from Google Books. Uh, it's a, an English translation of the histories by Herodotus. And for those who know the Herodotus, it's full of references to places, of course, uh, mentions of places like Athens and Sparta. As a human reader, uh, that's completely clear to us. We have the context. We know what Athens is. We know that Athens is a place. We also know that it's about Athens uh, in Attica, so the ancient Athens, not Athens, the, the capital of modern Greece. To computers, that's not obvious. So what we want to do is we want to have unambiguous identifiers, and we want to annotate the content with those un unambiguous identifiers. And in this case, we give them identifiers saying, okay, I'm talking about Athens, and I assign it the identifier Pleiades 579885, or for Sparta, handing out uh, the, the identifier Pleiades 570685. So that's just an ID number from somewhere uh, which provides me with an identifier for those two places. So those who've been in the uh, digital humanities domain, they probably heard about Pleiades. Uh, what is Pleiades? Well, Pleiades is a gazetteer. Uh, it's basically a website or a database of places from the ancient world. It has a website, you can search for places, but the real value of Pleiades uh, is that it has identifiers for places. It also has geometry, it has names, all that sort of stuff which you expect from a gazetteer, but the real value and what we're interested in from Pelagio's side of things is just those identifiers. So in Pleiades, every place has a URI and that's the value of Pleiades for us in Pelagios. We can also do this with different kinds of media, so we can have an image, uh, and this image is actually a screenshot from a tool which I'm going to show just in a minute. We can also do this with different gazetteers, of course, so you don't need to be limited to Pleiades, there are also other gazetteers. Of course, you all know GeoNames, you know the, the Getty thesaurus of geographic names. 
So those are, I would say, global gazetteers. Uh, but there are also other gazetteers, which I would call community gazetteers, which are very focused on a specific cultural domain, maybe, or a specific area, or a specific uh, time interval. This here, for example, is an example from Past Place. That's an emerging gazetteer, which aims to cover the whole world after Pleiades, uh, roughly speaking, so uh, medieval Europe, or uh, sort of equivalent time ranges all, ranges all over the world. Uh, but we're not restricting the gazetteer. Uh, the principle is just to have this annotation process with gazetteer URIs. From an abstract point of view, uh, you could say that what, what, is, what is it that we're doing? Uh, we have our, oh, I don't see the mouse pointer here. But anyways, on the bottom, uh, we have our web resources. And those could be web pages, they could be produced from a, data, uh, from a database, whatever. They will have links among each other already because they're documents on the web. But individually, they might be isolated. So there might be sort of silos around the web. On the other end, we have the gazetteers. They will also have links between places. For example, Pleiades Athens is linked to Pleiades Attica as sort of the higher order administrative, administrative division. But again, the gazetteers themselves, they might be isolated, they might be silos. And what Pelagius achieves is that it, first of all, through this act of annotation, it creates links between the documents and the places. And if you look sort of at the bottom, you can see that there are two documents which may have been isolated before but because they are now referencing the same place, there's now a connection. We also have a mechanism which is not based on annotation, but it's very similar, and it's based on linked data in, in, in any case, which creates connections between gazetteers. So you can also say, okay, here's, my, here's Athens in my gazetteer, and here's Athens in your gazetteer, let's create a connection. Uh, and again, uh, through this network, we might again make connections between documents uh, on the bottom level, which may not have existed before. So that was the uh, uh, sort of abstract view, uh, but from a user's point of view, that's not so useful. So users like interfaces they can use to search. And we've experimented with something which is more a bit like sort of Google Maps. And I will show you what we built in the last uh, months of, of the Pladius 3 project. So this is an interface which allows you to explore all sorts of data coming from our partners. So you, uh, you can explore the entire collection at once. You can say, okay, here's the coverage of the entire collection. Uh, you can see here uh, the, uh, the, the temporal distribution. You can see the various facets, where the data is coming from, for example, from which, from which sources the data is coming from, which languages the documents are in, um, and you can search. You can set filters on pretty much anything. So let's set the filter, for example, for uh, one of the collections. So that's one of the partner data sets. You can see what the coverage of this one data set is. You can see what the... Uh, temporal distribution of the data set is, uh, let's set a filter on one of the smaller data sets, that's called the Aerial Photographic Archive uh, of the Middle East. So again, different distribution of the partner data set. You can also see um, uh, preview images, uh, many data sets come with sort of thumbnail images for the records in there. You have full text search, so in this case we can search for a term. Uh, one example I like to use is the tetradrachum. That's say an ancient Greek coin type. So we search for it. We can see, okay, here's the geographical distribution for this uh, search term. You can also see the temporal distribution for this specific search term. If you zoom in somewhere, uh, things get updated in real time. So you can see, okay, the temporal distribution changes because that's the temporal distribution in just that map area. We can also see on this different uh, dot sizes, there are different sort of local centers where most of these items are located. We can zoom further, we, uh, we can pan the map further, and we will see that the temporal distribution will adapt to your current viewport. So if you zoom out again, we can also drag the handles. And uh, we can see, okay, the, the distribution changes because that's just the, uh, the items in that particular time span. And if we drag it across, you can see how sort of this footprint changes. And you can also see on those bigger dots how the local centers sort of start to change and, and wander around. And that really is, is just based on people tagging up their items with a little bit of sort of Dublin Core type metadata for timing and, and these kinds of things, plus those annotations in the gazetteer. So a really nice interface that works across many collections because those collections basically use linked data. I think that's sort of the point to take uh, home, that's sort of the power of linked data. 
Ah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm going to stop this here to not spend too much time. Um, so the question is, what you've seen here uh, was uh, a partner, or this, this tetra tracking example is, is one specific example for, for a database kind of content. So there was, was a database with coin finds, and every coin had a single point. Uh, that doesn't really work when, you have, when you're dealing with literature, like the, his, the histories, Herodotus, because you have one object, and it has lots of points and lots of coverage. So this tool also can handle this. The question there is more, how do you actually work? Uh, how do you actually produce those annotations? Uh, and in the past two years, we had a project where we built some tooling which enabled us to tag documents, uh, specifically texts and maps. And I also want to show you a short screencast of that tool. That cool tool is called uh, Recogito. Uh, and it was a tool which we built uh, for us to tag uh, specific corpus which we defined uh, as part of the project. So what you can see here is the image annotation area. So we could upload um, maps to the tool, uh, and then we could start to identify uh, places referenced in those maps. So there was a simple drag, a, a quick tool where you could very quickly create um, transcriptions, basically. Um, we, started to we started to investigate ways of how we could automate this, and it turns out for handwritten maps, uh, it's, it's pretty much impossible at the state of the art to, to automate the identification of toponyms. So instead, we took a route of saying, okay, we're going to build a manual tool for annotation, uh, but we build what, we're going to build one which is really quick, so where you can do the basic steps uh, very rapidly. So you can have with two clicks, you click, you drag, you click again, and you, you basically already identified the location uh, of, of a toponym, of a place name on a map. Then there is a way to transcribe. So you can simply add uh, a transcription. And this way you build up your annotation base within that tool. We have, uh, just finished that. Yeah. We have the same interface for texts. In this case, we can automate a lot of things. Uh, the texts are already digital texts, so plain text basically. Uh, we did run our texts, which we worked on in the project through named entity recognition first. Uh, but again, it turns out named entity recognition is, of course, not perfect. So again, we wanted a user interface, which on the one hand allows us to manually tag and manually correct uh, very quickly. And also you can see on this color coding, so there are gray things and, and green things. The green things mean, okay, here we have already a valid annotation. Uh, so the basic principle in Pelagios has always been that we want to hand validate these things because we just want to ensure the data quality. Here's another interface uh, which shows you once you have annotated your text, you also need to create those mappings to the gazetteer. That's a bit of a trickier interface. I can't go into the details there, but that's basically a view where you can go through all the annotations that you created. You can see which gazetteer match the computer has done. Uh, you can search for better matches if you think it was a bad match done by the computer. And you can, again, sort of uh, um, quality control and also correct automatic matches. Yeah, and if you want to learn a little bit more about the tool, uh, the URL uh, below, uh, that's sort of a, so a beginner's tutorial where you can read through and you can see uh, how the tool works and whether it's something that you want to use maybe too. Okay, just some quick uh, numbers in terms of the output, because uh, one criticism, of course, okay, that's all manual tooling, so how productive are you with it? And I think we were quite productive uh, just to show what we did in this two-year project, which was spent on the one hand on building those, those tools, but also on using those tools. Uh, my colleagues, uh, they went through 317 documents uh, in this tool in eight different languages. They identified uh, almost 130,000 toponyms in maps and texts and hand verified about half of, of those. So hand verification is, of course, the more tedious, tedious process. Uh, that's why we're not uh, uh, completely, uh, did everything uh, completely validated 100%, but 50%, I think, is already quite a high number as well. We also uh, submitted this, uh, the tool to uh, a thing called the Open Humanities Award, and we suggested uh, that if we get this award, we would hold two public workshops with students, and uh, we were at lucky to win this award, so we held two workshops, one at the University of Heidelberg and one at the University of Mainz, where we would just let students play with the tool. Uh, and again, that was, first of all, it was a lot of fun, I have to say, and it was also quite impressive on how productive the, the students were. Here are some impressions from the workshop. 
So that's the session at Heidelberg. We had 27 students of different backgrounds, uh, geography and archaeology primarily. And yeah, there's another uh, picture from, from Mainz, from the second workshop, uh, which we held uh, with two, 22 students, again mixed backgrounds, uh, again archaeology, but this time also engineering students, so different kind of anger. Uh, yeah, that was about one year ago. And the students were quite, we were really quite impressed with uh, at the quantity, first of all. Uh, so they identified more than 5,000 places in texts. And if you play around it with yourself, you can see that's actually really quite productive. So you can just double click on a place name in the text and it's basically tagging up a text is almost as fast as reading a text. Um, they also located more than 5,500 toponyms on maps. Again, I think that shows that the tools sort of getting mature and that's uh, you can really work quickly with the tool. Uh, they made 1,450 map transcriptions. Again, you can see that's sort of more effort required, lower number, uh, and 680 gazetteer resolutions. Again, this was a thing, that's the most tedious part of the process, uh, and that takes the most time. But one thing which I think was also worth mentioning, uh, in the first session we had about 140 gazetteer resolutions, then we redesigned the user interface completely, and then we got like almost 500. So uh, that also shows that you can really gather feedback very, very uh, explicitly in, in when, when you have people work with it at an early stage already. Yeah, that's just an example of what a tagged map looks like in the tool afterwards. Uh, I'm not sure whether you can really see it that perfectly. No, anyways. <laughs> I think you can see there are many gray boxes. The gray boxes basically mean you have an annotation which also has a transcription. Uh, the red boxes simply mean, okay, we have the location of the toponym, but we have no transcription. And those few, uh, the green ones mean, okay, here we have transcription plus gazetteer match. Okay. Yeah, so here's the green one. And you can sort of see this imbalance. So it's quick to tag, it's quick to transcribe. It's not so quick to do the gazetteer matching, but again, uh, I think uh, with more user interface work invested, things get better there too. Yeah, so the question is how can you reuse the stuff that we do? Well, one thing is you can reuse the data as a user. Uh, we are a community. We try to, uh, on the one hand, encourage people to prepare their data as linked data. Uh, and this thing is something that I haven't come across too often yet, but I hope that we will come across it more often in the future, where you have, in this case, it's a portal run by the American Numismatic Society, and they have a link called Link Data down here. And one of the Link Data icons is a Pelagius icon, and you can download RDF uh, according to the Pelagius profile. Uh, we don't have our own ontology or anything. We are, re we are reusing ontologies, but we are making recommendations about which properties to use uh, and how to expose metadata about your stuff in a very limited way, but in the same way uh, that other people are doing it to make things more interoperable. Another thing, uh, Recogito, our own tool, of course, you can also download the data there. All the annotation data is, uh, by definition, CC0 licensed in Recogito, so you can just visit the URL, download the data. In this case, it's, it's CSV data because it's tabular data, uh, and it's easy to transform in, into all sorts of other um, formats. Uh, it's also easy to import in a spreadsheet. It's easier to import in a GIS system because we didn't with place, so you might want to use a GIS system for exploring uh, the data in more depth. It's all possible. Also, if you go to Recogito, you can have those uh, preview pages here, uh, which show a map view of a particular document that was annotated. Uh, again, you can download the data right from those preview pages. We also have an API, uh, an API, one of the evil APIs. Uh, of course, we're based primarily on the idea of uh, making things available under stable URIs, but I think there is still one thing missing, and that is easy search. So the, IP, the API is really there for people to define simple search queries and then discover the resources through that. And the search API in that case is, it, it's basically simple. Uh, it allows you to, to search for the basic properties that Pelagius collects about objects. You can do things like, okay, here's a query term uh, on the full text like silver. So give me everything on silver that matches on the term silver between 100 BC, 180 for a specific place. So that's the kind of things that the search API does. Uh, and I also should say we 
primarily built it to sort of eat our own dog food uh, because that's the API that Peripleo is running on. So everything that Peripleo does, you could actually do yourself just based on this. Um, in general, all the tools are open source. Uh, we have a GitHub account called github.com slash Pelagios and everything's hosted there. For every tool um, that we, we have, we also run a public instance. So these are the instances where, where we set up our own our own Perry player and our Recogito, so you can play around with that. It's a prototype, I should say, the Perry player one at least. Uh, Recogito is sort of more tested already, uh, but again, we will be working, or we hope that we will be working in the next two years very uh, heavily on making these tools uh, more widely available, uh, also where, so that you can upload your own content, for example, and work in your own workspaces also improving the documentation to set up your own, your own instances in your own institution. That's all possible now, perfectly possible, and people have done it, but obviously the documentation and everything is still sort of, uh, there's um, room for improvement there, I would say. Um, yeah, again, also one thing that's, that's worth mentioning, uh, when you want to work with Pelagios in any way, uh, you need gazetteers, so gazetteers are at the heart, uh, so you should either align your data to one popular gazetteer like GeoNames or Pleiades or any gazetteer really that's suitable or which you think is suitable for your, uh, for your domain. You can also bring your own gazetteer, uh, so that's also perfectly possible. Again, we have some sort of a, a, an RDF profile defined. That's not our own ontology, that's just reusing things from other ontologies, uh, but we just have a page where we document things uh, that other people have done and where we recommend, okay, if you do it like that, if you use those kinds of properties, then you will have the same kind of structure that other people are using for their gazetteers and that makes things interoperable. Yeah, so finally I want to end with a call that you should not only ask what Pelagios can do for you, but also what you can do for Pelagios. Uh, first of all, of course, you can use it and give us feedback. That's very important for us. We are looking for more use cases, specifically from the library domain. Um, you can publish your data as linked open data link it to Pelagios, uh, there are our profiles which you may want to take a look at, but really even if you don't follow our profiles, I think the main point is use URIs for places uh, when you refer to places in your data, I think that's the key point. Um, yeah, and that's I think is the, the point I want to end with as well, so thanks for your uh, attention and I hope for questions. <laughs>